I became a biologist because from a very young age, I was completely obsessed with wildlife. If it didn't matter if it was an earthworm or a snake or a fish or a shark or a bird, if it was a creepy crawly, if it had feathers, scales, fur, I wanted to know everything about it. So as you grow up, you, uh, you figure out that the way to continue that passion is through the sciences of becoming a biologist. Well, the rarest shark that I've ever found, that's kind of a tough question because my whole thing is rare sharks. But on an expedition to South Africa, we found the flap-nosed hound shark an animal that hadn't been documented by science for over a hundred years. And not only did we get an image of it or find a dead specimen like some of the other uh, extinct creatures that I've worked with, but I actually got to fish for, capture, hold, and tag a flap-nosed hound shark. Now just think about that for a second. An animal that for over 110 years, the world had given up for as extinct. An animal that nobody knew whether or not it was still around, and we found one of these beautiful purple, goofy-faced creatures and managed to stick a tag on it and get a bunch of scientific data. So that was, I mean, that was pretty phenomenal. On this expedition, the most unforgettable encounter we have had with sharks was the first time I saw a leopard epaulette. We were days into the trip on the liveaboard on this very boat, and we hadn't seen the leopard epaulette yet. We're on a dive, and sure enough, you look down, and there's a little tail sticking out of this rocky crevice. And uh, just the, the shape of the tail, the size, the spotting, it literally took my breath away. My heart started beating out of control, and I was like, this is it. That could be the shark. And we'd already had a couple other sort of scares, if you will, as to what it could have been. And that was it, diving down, getting my hands on that epaulette shark. I mean, it was a, it was a huge moment. Papua New Guinea is a crazy place. It has a fearsome reputation the world over. It's the only place where active cannibalism is supposedly still happening. And this is a first for Shark Week. We are the first Shark Week crew to ever come to PNG. And it has been a very difficult expedition. We have struggled not just with weather and not just with some very dangerous locals who ended up being incredibly friendly, but with, uh, with the sharks. You know, when you are on the frontier of new travel when it comes to expeditions for sharks, there is no go to this spot, throw in the bait, and up comes all the sharks. It's not like many other shows and many other trips to film sharks. This is all new groundbreaking stuff. And outside of, well, all I'll say is it's been very successful. Walking sharks, better known as epaulette sharks, are a member of the cat shark family. And they get that name from a slit in their eye that looks very much like a, like a cat's eye and they are a fantastic species. They're a fantastic group of animals. There are nine known species of walking sharks, and they get that name not because they have legs and feet, because they have specially evolved and adapted pectoral and pelvic fins. And the way that they move is they undulate their body, think like a salamander, where they turn to this side, use this, this uh, pectoral fin and this pelvic fin and grab some land and then turn and keep using their body to walk back and forth. Now for a shark to walk is absolutely incredible. It's like some kind of missing link. It's like, here's a fish that is halfway between a fish and an amphibian. You know, it's, it's, it's fins are changing into legs. Its body is adapting to be able to live in these anoxic environments where there's low oxygen, high temperatures, all kinds of things that creatures typically can't live in. Um, and the thing is, of the nine known species of epaulette, three of them occur here in PNG. And because PNG is so remote, it's so dangerous, it's so difficult and so vast, there's practically no science on these animals. So our expedition here has been one of the very first expeditions to study these creatures and truly one of the first real PNG shark expeditions. In my free time, when I'm not studying, researching or filming sharks, I'm studying, researching, or filming other animals. I, I'm a wildlife biologist just as much as I am a shark biologist, and my entire life is sort of evolved around wildlife and expeditions and planning and trips. However, every now and then I get a brief glimpse of time to actually hang out with my family, see my son, play a game of rugby here and there, and spend time with friends, but nobody cares about that. That's dull. I like the wildlife. Uh, I've been bitten by sharks twice, actually. Uh, the, the first time was on my foot, um, and there's not much of a scar left. I think there's a tiny one on my toe. Yeah, there is actually. There's still a little scar there on my nasty looking big toe. And uh, that was kind of funny. I was uh, doing some shark work and we had shark, uh, shark on the deck 
and I got bumped, and so I stood close to the shark, latched right onto my foot, um, and that didn't go too terribly. The second time was when filming for Extinct or Alive and working with uh, just a plethora of lemon sharks around the boat. We're sort of feeding, and as I was getting the chum going, working, I sort of was distracted and looked back just in the nick of time to see the shark jaw coming right at me and pulled my arm back, but didn't get out of there without one foul little snaggle tooth from the side of a lemon shark just clipping my wrist as I pulled back. Had it been another millisecond, I probably would have lost the hand, but misses as good as a mile. If I was a shark, I wouldn't want to be one of these big toothy white sharks or a tiger shark, no way. I'd want to be a carpet shark. I'd want to be a tasseled wobbegong with this hilarious looking face of seaweed bits and a tail that acts as a lure. And I could just veg out all day long in the sand or the reef, just waiting for that meal to float by me, slurp it on in, eat up something delicious and go back to napping on the sand. Screw being a big, big pelagic shark. That's way too much work. You know, there are all these poster child species, great white sharks, hammerheads, tiger sharks. Don't get me wrong, they're awesome sharks, but everybody and their uncle has studied those sharks, right? Because they're cool and they're big. But there are so many incredible species, 8,000 something species of shark, that the world only knows about like 10 of them really well. And so understanding more of these sharks gives us information that allows us to understand a complete picture of the ecology of an environment. So if you understand just the apex predators, you kind of understand everything that's below it in that system. But once you understand the predators and the prey below that and the prey below that and the ecosystem that they all live in, you start to get a picture of the entire ecology of a system. And once you understand the ecology of a system, you can understand how to properly protect it.